This week, is this the smartest building in Italy? The latest worker drones? And beat this, a hearty handful. On July the 12th, the internet as we know it will change. Go to Amazon, Twitter, Reddit or many other sites and you could be asked to wait on a slower connection or pay extra or you may be blocked altogether. Thankfully, these warnings aren't real. They're part of an internet-wide protest with the aim of protecting net neutrality. Net neutrality is the basic principle that protects our freedom of speech on the internet. It's the guiding rules that have made the internet into what it is today. And it prevents our internet service providers, so the cable companies like Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T, from controlling what we can see and do when we go online. Under the net neutrality principle, all data should be treated equally by ISPs. That means they can't slow down companies who refuse to pay to have their data prioritised. And they can't charge customers for fast access to certain data. Today the FCC's open internet rules go into effect. There's now a referee on the field to protect consumers and innovators online. But the US Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, voted recently to overturn rules from 2015 which enshrine these neutrality principles and which meant telecoms firms could be fined for non-compliance. And that, says the organiser of the July the 12th protest, will play right into the big cable company's hands. If we lose net neutrality, you're going to start to see the internet look more like cable TV. You can imagine trying to go to a social media site and getting a notification from your internet service provider saying, oh, sorry, if you want to access this site, you need to upgrade to our social media package. You need to upgrade to our streaming video package. Uh, you need to pay us more in order to access the same sites that you've been using uh, day after day for years. They can also go to those sites and charge them extra fees in order to deliver their content to users. And of course, those fees get passed on to all of us. So it's really an issue that affects every single person that uses the internet, regardless of your political views. It's going to hit us in the pocketbook. And this won't just affect US internet users. If you use an American web service, which let's face it, is most of us, it may affect the service that they provide to us. The FCC says that the 2015 rules are unnecessary and may have stifled investment in next generation networks. And free market think tanks agree. Well, this fight could have been resolved 10 years ago if it were really just about net neutrality. Uh, this has really primarily been a fight about the FCC's uh, power to regulate the internet. We had a first major update to our communications law 20 years ago, uh, and that law made it unclear exactly how the FCC was going to regulate the internet. And that ambiguity has, uh, has left the agency to, to, to wrestle with this issue for a decade. And, uh, and in a nutshell, there were simpler, better ways of dealing with this issue. There were other agencies that could have addressed net neutrality concerns when they arose, starting back in 2008. And, uh, and Congress has three times tried to legislate, and both Republicans and Democrats, I think, share the blame for missing the opportunity to craft uh, a solution that would resolve this issue. And that, unfortunately, has led us to where we are today, which is a third rulemaking at the FCC uh, to deal with this issue of legal authority when the rules themselves, the core of net neutrality, have really never been controversial. Well, I wonder what the original inventor of the concept of net neutrality would make of these changes. Uh, you know, it's very disappointing, let's put it that way. So, you know, the Obama administration had finally put net neutrality into law, done a good job with it, everyone was happy with it. Out of nowhere, the Trump administration, and it's not any public movement against net neutrality, it's really the cable and phone companies, you know, want to make more money, let's put it that way. 
and, and they have somehow, kind of under the cover of, of Trump's ma madness, uh, managed to, to, to start the process to undo net neutrality. The thing is making uh, the government realize that there are severe electoral consequences for, for messing with net neutrality. It has to be understood as the third rail, that you mess with this and, and you're going to get people very angry uh, descending on, on constituents. But not everyone agrees that next week's protest will make much of a difference. The current FCC leadership has uh, been very clear about their views of the FCC's legal authority and their minds are not going to be changed by an angry mob or by uh, what amount to policy arguments. Well, whatever happens next week, I have a feeling it won't be the last word we hear on net neutrality. Just a hunch. Welcome to the Royal Society of Arts in London, which this week was hosting its annual summer science exhibition. For one week only, universities from around the country gather here to bring their cutting edge science experiments out of the lab and into the public's imagination. Oh, you see, it's great being here, kid. In another room, I got to feel the difference between a healthy heart and one suffering from cardiomyopathy. The robotic hearts are beating in sync with my own heartbeat, which is being detected by the monitors on my wrists. I can feel this one's beating quite regularly. This one is, is beating faster and it's beating weaker. So if my heart was diseased, it would feel more like this one, which is a good incentive not to get one of these. Oh, and by the way, if you were wondering who the next Doctor Who is going to be, Two hearts. Right, time to get them beating a bit faster. Whether you love or loathe the trip to the shops, retail is changing, but there's more to it than people just shopping online instead. Can I just see what colours there are down lower? Sure. Here's an idea that takes shopping online a step further. One company's software allows you to go to a shop's website and from there you can connect to a shop assistant in store who will be wearing a pair of smart glasses. Yeah, what do we have there on the right? There, is, there are some bags. Can you uh, please take the cream bag off the shelf and can you open it and show me the compartment? The shop has actually found that the same experience being streamed through a mobile has actually proved more popular than the smart glasses. And although I found the experience pretty good, it does of course have some limitations. Oh, I see. I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was going around your waist. I'm glad I asked you. If when shopping online you're worried about getting your size right, then these smart leggings could help. They aim to be able to measure you and tell you the exact right size of jeans that you should be buying. Hmm. Like a glove hopes to measure up women for the right size and style of jeans for their body shape. The stretchy measuring leggings connect via Bluetooth to a smartphone app where your stats will be stored so you can keep track of your body shape. Oh, my waist measurement here seems to be about five inches larger than I thought it was and a fair bit bigger than the jean size I normally wear. When I clicked through to the suggestions, my size was as expected. The company say these measurements represent where the jeans would sit rather than actual measurements you would expect. Might upset a few people along the way though. But another trend emerging is that we head back to the high street, but shop assistants, as we know them, don't. Wheelies unmanned stores are open 24 hours a day, with only a series of cameras and microphones keeping an eye on you. You gain access through your smartphone, use it to scan your purchases and pay, then head off. Their first branch opened in Sweden last year, followed by another in Shanghai recently. The launch of Amazon Go's first store in Seattle appears to have been delayed, but aims to replace queues and checkouts by using computer vision, deep learning and data from sensors. It'll see what you've picked up in store and in turn charge your Amazon account. 
But one US company has another idea about self-service. Well, on first view, this does just look like an ordinary vending machine that happens to have a TV screen on it. But a machine like this could soon be selling alcohol, cannabis and even guns. Let me explain more. The device uses biometric sensors to identify users by the veins in their fingers, meaning you can turn a standard machine into an apparently secure one, only dispensing goods to the person with the right to collect them. And yes, in the US, that item could be a gun. The company claims the machine uses the same level of security employed by US military and large corporations to access facilities, but they do add... Everything is hackable. If, if it's connected to the internet, they say where there's water, there's sharks. Where there's uh, internet connectivity, somebody can make their way in there, perhaps. We've jumped through every possible hoop we can do to make sure that only the person standing in front of it is able to get the product that they want, if it's that sort of regulated product. Right, and there are guns and alcohol available too. So some fellas going out hunting and uh, they leave late from work and they rush out there to catch, catch up with their friends. And usually you're far outside the city limits. You've made a whole plan, you made your trip, you get out there and you say, oh, I forgot my ammo. In this situation, a secured machine would allow you to pick up some ammo or even a replacement gun if you were in the system. Maybe get their whiskey off the one side, get their ammo off the other and head on into the camp and have a fine weekend of hunting. OK, maybe this isn't solving a problem that many people have. And suddenly, the idea of shops without assistance doesn't seem so surprising. Welcome to this week's tech news. Volvo announced they will only make electric and hybrid cars from 2019. Formula One racing team Williams unveiled a carbon fibre baby carrier that can transport critically ill newborn infants by ambulance or helicopter. The baby pod protects against vibrations and can be kept at a constant temperature. And sex robots designed to look like children should be banned. A report looking into the future of people's sexual relationships with robots said policymakers need to look at the issue and decide what is acceptable. Dubai police are to introduce a robot cop and autonomous patrol cars. The vehicles will use 360 degree surveillance technology to identify suspicious objects, launch a mini drone, and they claim even give chase to suspects. Google's in the doghouse again this time for a deal with a UK hospital that didn't respect the privacy of patients. The UK's information commissioner ruled that 1.6 million patient details were provided to Google's DeepMind illegally to help develop an app to diagnose kidney failure. And could tickets be replaced by inaudible sounds? Well, it seems maybe. Ticketmaster has teamed up with Listener, a company that uses ultrasonic sound technology to transmit information between devices. Checking into a venue with an app would give off this sound, and organizers could log who is in and where they are. Unless your phone dies, of course. Back at the Royal Society of Arts, I've finally got my robotic heart to beat a bit faster. Our individual lifestyles may affect our health personally, but our collective lifestyles have been affecting the world that we live in. It's one thing to talk about climate change and its effects on the environment, but it's another thing to actually see it in action. This is a simulation of the CO2 that was in the atmosphere in 2006. The red of it are the most CO2 heavy. What's really interesting is, have a look at the difference between the north and the south. Just look how much CO2 is covering China and the United States, if indeed that's what I'm looking at, because <laughs> you really can't see it under all the CO2. This work was created by the UK's Met Office and the Natural Environment Research Council. The scientists mashed up historical weather data with information coming from all sorts of modern sensors, including things like air traffic data, to try and predict the world's climate in the future. They're wanting to see how all different components that affect the climate, so the oceans, the atmosphere, the land and ice, how that all interacts and really that's so that the Met Office and also the Natural Environment Research Councils and their research centres can kind of give messages to policymakers about 
what's likely to happen and therefore what likely changes we're going to need to kind of keep to a safe level of global warming of two degrees. But pollution comes in many forms. If you live in a big city, for example, I'm sure you would count noise and congestion as just as harmful to your health as the air that we breathe. Now, currently, half of the world's population lives in cities, and in the next decade, that's expected to rise to five billion. And technology, city planners hope, will be part of the solution. Sensible City Lab from MIT has brought together a team of scientists and designers to truly understand our urban needs and how we can improve the designs of our cities in the future. The Agnelli Foundation was set up by the family behind Fiat Cars and its new shared office space has become a living research lab for the university. Catmo travelled to Turin in Italy to meet its designers. Like many things Italian, everything here is very stylish. The 60s building and the old Italian villa next door, which was once home to Mr. Fiat himself, were recently redeveloped and brought bang up to date. Well, even the cafeteria is suitably smart. As trendy as this place may be, its design is far from over. But going forward, the chief architects of this space will not be its creators, but its inhabitants. The idea behind this whole place is similar to any other big data project. Collect as much information as possible and make the whole thing more efficient. One theory on trial here is personalized heating. Instead of setting the heating for the whole building, workers here are able to set their own desired temperatures. So this system is actually quite clever. When there's a few of us sat in the same space, the system above us will take everyone's preferences and just average it out. And despite different personal heating settings, this setup is proving to be more efficient. The very cool thing is that uh, by understanding your exact position, yeah. uh, the system will shut down if you're not there. We are still, let's say, uh, simulating. We are still simulating numbers, but we are uh, almost sure that the, the improvement, the ecological and energetic improvement of the building could be up to 25%. Uh, in terms of uh, consumption. Beyond the personalised heating, the doors unlock and lights come on as you approach and you can find your colleagues on a map. Researchers hope these features will entice more users to download the app and share their location data so they can really get an accurate picture of how the building is being used, identify dead corners in spaces and improve the overall design in the future. Very often we speak about architecture as a third skin. The first one is our biological skin, the second one are our clothes, and the third one is actually the physical uh, world, the physical space we inhabit. Uh, so far, this, this, uh, this third skin has been very rigid, has been really like a corset. With this building, we make an attempt, we make a step forward, and we want to try to understand if this third skin could be something more flexible, more uh, tailor-fit to, uh, to our needs, and to, to the needs of the occupants of the space. This experiment is just the very beginning, and it's hard to think how rigid structures such as buildings can one day become more personalized and flexible. But I'm excited to think that we can all have a small say in what works. That was Cat Mo in Italy. Now, smart cities won't just consist of smart buildings and self-driving cars. Above our heads, autonomous drones will be busily buzzing about too. Drones already today are an integral part of a, of a city. Now, in the future, they will be even more dominant. They will be doing uh, deliveries, they will be doing uh, traffic control, monitoring, for example. They will be doing aerial and water sampling, uh, pollution monitoring but also infrastructure maintenance, servicing and repair. The drone I'm controlling at Mirko's lab is one of those repair drones, or at least a very early prototype. So down, up, left, right, forward, back. Drone researcher Pisak Chempriong is flying the thing. I'm in charge of the robot arm underneath, which may one day be able to build, manipulate and fix things on the fly in hard to reach places. And the idea is there would be some kind of robot gripper or, or a yep. manipulator on the end of this. Is 
technically this can be a um, multi-purpose uh, grouper. So if you just lower it over the body now, I will begin the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to suture the wound. Fixing bridges and maintaining buildings could, in theory, be done while hovering over the structure, but this isn't very stable and it's certainly going to be limited by battery life. A more sensible way is to have the drone land first. The problem here, though, is the top of that skyscraper or the side of that bridge might not allow for gentle, flat landings. The methodology that we use builds a lot on looking at nature and how nature solves the same challenges that it has. Now if you look at birds, how they do that, they do this with very complex morphing wings and visual navigation to land very precisely. However, insects use something very different. They just use the morphology to attach to the structure. So they fly and crash into the surface and stay attached like that. So a very different approach. One example of how we use this insect-inspired approach to perching is by looking at the ballooning spiders and by looking at the way how they use their string to entangle themselves in structures and remain aloft, we have built a, a vehicle that can do the same principles with a string that is de um, deposited from an aerial vehicle. By doing that, the string itself acts as an intelligent structure that entangles itself to any geometry that it attaches to. So it doesn't need to sense the geometry of its anchor point. The string itself, as simple as it is, takes away the need for the control and sensing of this part and allows it to attach itself very successfully. The sun rises. The radio plays the news. The team won. Today is the last day of the term. The traffic light turns green and the piano is silent. If you're in Manchester this month, you might see these poems dotted about the city. It's an art installation called Everything, Every Time, and the poetry is being created live using data from the city. Uh, Everything, Every Time is, is a poem. It's uh, those four screens that I have um, deployed on four different spots in Manchester City. It also runs on a website and basically um, it's a project about data and about the functionality of data. The book is returned and someone is waiting. All this data from weather to football scores to phases of the moon is fed into the algorithm which creates the poems. Each verse is a sequence of template lines which are triggered and shaped depending on what's happening right now, whether it's how late a bus is or if a performance is scheduled at the theatre. Throughout the city, the team wanted to display live poems which are constantly changing. So our four boards um, can each make a request to our API that lives in the cloud. The API in turn makes a request to one of about 130 different data points. The API makes an assessment on what the data means um, in terms of understanding whether or not something is busy, something is turned on, street lights are on or off, that kind of thing. Um, compiles the poem, makes sure it's formatted correctly so it's a readable poem and passes it back to the sign. Three of these go together. Um, each of these dots you can see here uh, is very, very delicate and turns over. And what happens is the text is then rendered as a dot, as a dot display. Um, they also make the best noise ever, so you get this fantastic kind of <laughs> clackety uh, flipping noise. Um, which is quite nice, so we sort of really have breathed new life into this creaking old tech, which is really, really cool. And you can catch everything, every time, around Manchester until August the 9th. Hope you like what you saw. Check us out on Twitter for more. I think I'll leave it to the data to do the poetry. Uh, we live at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we will see you soon.